Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a game from the 1961 Super Tournament between Bobby Fischer, who's playing the white side, versus Mikhail Tal. We have Fischer opening with e4, Tal replying with the Sicilian defense. The game enters an open system with d4, and to be more exact, after queen to c7, we have the Taimana variation. From here, g3 prepares to fink head of the bishop, also supports the queen bishop's development. And now knight to f6. This is already an important point in the game. And I bring this up because this natural looking developing move, knight f6, very common move to be seeing, is one that, um, well, if you're playing that as black, you need to be prepared to now enter a different type of a pawn structure. What am I talking about exactly? Well, I'm talking about the Zveshnikov type of pawn structure where if white makes a couple moves, black will be forced to move the e6 pawn to e5, and what do we have? We have a Zveshnikov type of pawn structure. Normally that pawn would play up to that e5 square in one move, but nevertheless, even if it takes two steps, same story, same uh, type of a pawn structure. And that can be imposed on black, and we see that take shape right away. The, the white knight makes use of b5. Now, one thing to point out is that if you don't want to eventually be forced into a Zveshnikov type of a structure, if you don't want to, as black, uh, be forced to play this e5 move, you had best not develop your knight right away to f6, but rather play this a6 move, keeping the knight out of b5. But since this square is available, Fisher makes use of it. It's very direct play. The queen is hit. She drops back to b8. The queen is hit again. And this is the point where now this e5 move is objectively best. And it's not the move which is played. Again, if this move is played, we have a Zveshnikov structure, d5 is weakened, white can be replying with bishop g5, looking to not only remove the number one defender of d5, but also smash open the black king side structure. We don't have that. Tali elects to keep the structure as is, and works the knight into a pin, knight to e5. This last move, move eight, is the one which practically loses the game. It's a big, big decision at this point, and I believe even further back, that move six, because if you're not, again, wanting to play this e5 move, you really shouldn't be playing the knight f6 move. At this point, it's big trouble for black, and white will be the side who is throwing all the punches, and black is on their heels. So, let's see exactly what takes place. The queen would love to play to d4 at this point, adding more fuel to that pinned piece but not so fast, there would be knight f3. So let's first watch over that f3 square. Bishop e2 does just that. And this is a curious move in itself because it's atypical. What's more typical is to play to g2. You've played to g3, you've played your pawn up to g3, normally you're going to fiend cut of the bishop, and from g2 it would be watching over f3, so why isn't that move played? And these are questions you could be asking of yourself if you're seeing your opponent make these type of a move these type of moves where you see an atypical move namely bishop e2 you should now question what are the differences between the atypical bishop e2 and the typical bishop g2 well here's one of the differences from e2 it watches over the c4 square which is regarded on the white side as being one of the softest squares when you're playing against an open sicilian it keeps this knight out of that c4 point. A knight from that square can be quite annoying. And it also, of course, addresses this f3 square. So it watches both c4 and f3, whereas if it was on g2, it's specifically just an f3 coverage. So from here, bishop c5 keeps the queen out of d4 and attempts at trying to shoo this knight away with a6 can actually be ignored. White could still play up to d4 piling up on the pinned piece. If the knight is defended, white can yet again ignore the threat on the knight and just castle. If the knight is taken, you grab the knight. If there is a recapture, black is dead. Um, so, we're not having that. Instead, it's just bishop c5. Bishop takes knight. Very direct play. The queen is recapturing, of course. f4, there is only one reply. So the queen drops back to b8. e5, very limited replies, very direct play. The knight, what does he do? Does he go home? If he goes home, knight e4. This bishop's hit. A knight 
on that d5 square I was talking in his Veshnikov structure, a knight on d5, again with this uh, black pawn if it's on e5, a knight on d5 would be wonderful. Shifted up one rank. If there's a knight getting to d6, he's priceless. Absolutely priceless. All the more valuable. So that cannot be allowed for sure. Instead, what we have is the counterattacking attempt with a6. Now, what is it that allows white to go in for this? This idea of get, grabbing the knight and then following up with f4, e5. Well, what's exactly going on? You give up your bishop pair. That's one thing. So you better have something to show for it. So what is shown for it? Well, white's grabbing space and doing so with gain of time. Queen is hit. More space is being gained. And now there's a support point on the weakest point in the black position, d6, with tempo, hitting the knight yet again. And, well, even though white doesn't have that dark square bishop, his friends are around, the pawns on dark squares in particular, to watch over those squares. And keep in mind this bishop not doing a lot in this position, is he? So white also has still a lead in development. So these are some factors that you could be looking into. You usually have to show something for giving up the bishop pair. White has enough to show for it. So a6 from here. Pawn takes knight, pawn takes knight, pawn takes pawn, rook g8. Knight e4, the bishop is hit. These are all reactionary moves by black. We've been seeing a lot of this. Has to cover f6, otherwise there would be a fork. Queen d4, looking to jump into that f6 square. And now rook to a, rook to a4. Uh, one other try that black can maybe be going with is to try and get the queens off the board. Certainly when you do a king comparison, the black king is the more vulnerable. So maybe something along the lines of queen a4 and maybe trying to, let's say, okay, first give a check and then come back here. I'm not sure of the exact moves, but the idea, the main idea that I want to bring your attention to is trying to get these queens off the board. Uh, it's not something that Tal goes forward with. Instead, it is rook to a4. And now still comes knight to f6, and he has to be captured. Playing the king to d8 allows queen b6, and the rook will be captured in short order. So bishop takes knight, queen recaptures. Queen c7, hits c2. It's defended, and this pawn is allowed to be captured. And keep in mind with that last move by white, fully developed. And this bishop remains on its home square, and it's still two moves off from even moving. It's kind of odd to see both b7 and d7, um, well, the b and d pawn still on their home squares. So... Black grabs that a2 pawn, king b1, defends, stops the rook from coming to a1, and now the rook drops back. It might be a bit tempting to play the move queen to a5 because it threatens mate in one, but there's a good reason to not make a move such as that. What's the reason? Well, after something as convenient as b3, what do you do now as black? I use the word convenient, by the way, because the queen is a good defensive piece and she is still functioning in an aggressive way. She's on this f6 outpost and she can't be dislodged. She's watching over this pawn who's just a single step away from queening and unless there's an additional ingredient that black could throw into the mix, unless there's an additional attacker that black can throw in to try and get at that white the white king, this queen is essentially just tied down to the, to the defense of the rook. Not a situation you really want to be in. So, instead, after king b1, the rook comes back, bishop takes pawn, rook b6, bishop d3, white looks to grab on h7, and then the rook, and, and uh, so as a reply, we have e5. Now, this is the point in the game where, if you'd like to, pause the video, see if you can find the move that Fisher played at this point, move number 23. Okay. The move that Fisher played at this point was f takes e, allowing the queen to be captured, and it is. Rook takes queen, pawn takes rook, and there's nothing that could be done about this pawn being taken and also the rook being taken. Queen c5, bishop takes, queen g5, bishop takes rook. This is all pretty much forced, and after the smoke clears, what we end up having is a very, uh, un well, it's unbalanced position, and it's stripped down to what exactly? Two rooks versus the queen, and 
the only thing that white is needing to watch out for is the potential for a perpetual check. So white does well to try and stay coordinated. First we have a couple checks being thrown in and eventually a white rook drops back to the first rank making sure that the queen is not going to be giving perpetual in any way. Pawn bumps up, the rook gets right behind it. G4, the pawn isn't taken at this point. Okay, we had queen h3, the pawn isn't taken because rook h1, and no matter what black does next, um, rook to h8. Or in other words, if the queen tries to still defend this square, you still play to h8. And then eventually you get the queen. So that's why we're not having this queen grab on g4. Instead, queen h3. The pawn marches on. The rook gives a check, getting out of the way of the queen. Finally, that pawn is taken. The king tries to get off of that back rank, but white says, go no further. The sixth rank is now under control, and soon the game plan for here uh, for white will be to control the seventh rank once the seventh rank is under control to then get on that eighth rank. Let's see how that takes shape. D1, eventually both rooks are on the sixth rank. B3, an additional flight square for the king. B2 and A2 now available. King just shuffling on H7, and after rook to A6, Tall ends up resigning, and there's nothing that could be done. The threat here is, again, to get either one of these rooks to the seventh rank and then eventually control the eighth rank. If both of these rook moves are prevented, the queen would be having to play to either b7 or c7. If she plays to either one of these, this is what can follow. A bunch of checks, and eventually the queen is lost by force. And similarly, if we have, let's say, the queen not playing to either one of these squares, and instead just sticks around on this eighth rank, we could have check on the seventh. Both rooks are now on the 7th, and a similar story again. If the queen hangs around on now b8 or c8, we have these checks thrown in. And once again, the queen will be lost. So, as it stands in this game, after this uh, 47th move, rook to a6, black ends up resigning. So, it's a pretty impressive game. Interesting to see how important it could be at that very early stage, move 6, to have that knight f6 move. If you don't want to obtain that, if you don't, if you don't want to go into that Zveshnikov structure, then you should be playing that a6 move on move 6. But as it went in that game, move 8, knight to e5, it was already at that point um, black being on their heels and they had a tough road ahead, weren't able to recover. So that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.